Wasn't, wasn't it a blessing to have Peter Lill back here last Sunday and then Dr. Walkie? I was thinking this week, we got to see Dr. Walkie some this week, and what a gift he has been from straight from the hand of the Lord uh, to his church. Uh, we have been so blessed here uh, at Believer's Chapel over the years to have uh, these wonderful servants, uh, very gifted people, uh, thinking back, of course, to Dr. Johnson and now Dan, but uh, J uh, James Montgomery Boyce. Uh, J.I. Packer uh, was here, uh, Ed Bloom, Haddon Robinson, uh, mining my mind to try to remember all the different people uh, that have been here, but uh, we're really blessed to get to have them, and I want to thank Dan and uh, also Mike Black and, and others for uh, arranging for Dr. Waltke to be here so that we could receive that uh, blessing. Uh, the Whitfield Society was involved in it as well. So uh, thanks go out. If, if any of you are listening, I suspect you are. We really uh, are very grateful. Thank you, Jeff, for coordinating and administrating and uh, keeping Mike Black in line. We really <laughs> appreciate that. Well, we're in uh, Luke chapter 5. You may see in uh, the bulletin. Uh, we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 11. When we arrive at the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, one might think that we would be advanced, well advanced into the uh, public life uh, of the Lord Jesus. But because much of these early chapters in Luke are taken up by his detailed uh, birth narratives, uh, this fifth chapter finds Jesus still in an early stage of his public ministry. He's been baptized, he's been tempted by the devil, and begun what would prove to be his most avid early investment of his time, uh, teaching uh, the good news of the Word of God. He taught with authority, and that always impressed those he addressed, but he also said things uh, many considered outrageous. And so he's already experienced uh, the rejection of the citizens of Nazareth, his hometown, and then spent a very busy day in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, uh, teaching in the synagogue there and leaving uh, those listeners agog with uh, wonder, uh, then casting out a demon from a tormented man with just a word. They arrive at Simon Peter's mother-in-law's home and they find her terribly ill with a very high fever. Jesus heals her immediately. And these miracles led to a parade of people uh, coming uh, to, after the Sabbath, uh, bringing their friends and their family who were suffering with different maladies and illnesses to be miraculously healed uh, by this man, uh, Jesus. Uh, deep into the night, he healed this steady stream of sufferers. And then he left Capernaum, uh, Luke advising us at the end of the fourth chapter that he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. And then in this fifth chapter, Luke shifts scenes to the, the shore of Galilee, writing, now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land, and he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. 
But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet. You may have in your margin, he, he fell down at Jesus' knees, which makes sense if Jesus was still in that sitting a posture that he had assumed. But we translated, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. Let's bow in a moment of prayer. Father, how grateful we are that we can get up on a Lord's Day morning and come to this place and open up your word, your very word that you have given to us. We believe uh, it is inspired. We, in, we believe it is sufficient for everything that we need for faith, uh, for practice, and so how grateful we are. We lift up our hearts of gratitude to you this morning for that gift. And we're uh, con convinced, Lord, that you're with us here. Uh, this would be a fruitless exercise were you not, but you have told us that uh, where we've gathered like this, uh, you are here in the, the midst of us. And so we pray that this might be a time of, of uh, spiritual reflection, of uh, self-examination, of deep interest in the words on the pages of our Bible as you speak to us uh, by your Spirit, and that you might move in our hearts to to work your perfect work in us as we hear your word proclaimed. And we lift up our songs of thanksgiving to you, our, our songs of worship, and we pray that uh, you would accept them uh, as rightful praise of Almighty God, a, a great Savior, a, a friend of sinners. And Father, we uh, are mindful of the many uh, difficulties that uh, your saints are undergoing. We pray for the Knox family. Uh, we pray, Lord, for those that are sick and can't be here. Uh, and yet some of them are listening, even now. And we want them to know that we're praying for them. And we're praying for your healing mercies. Uh, we're praying for the peace that can only come from you and for comfort to them. And Lord, uh, we're, as I said at the beginning, how grateful we are for uh, the ministry of the word that has gone forth from here over the years, uh, 60 plus years. Thank you, Father, for that. And may it continue into the future according to your perfect will. Uh, Lord, bless our time uh, afterwards, uh, observing the Lord's Supper, remembering our Savior, and uh, Father, will you also bless our time uh, of lunch together afterwards? If we have visitors here, Lord, we pray that they'd uh, be comfortable, they'd be welcomed, and that they may be, might be blessed by their time with us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been living in historic times. This pandemic has uncovered some surprising human traits. One is that if you offer people money without expecting labor in return, many will take you up on it. But we all know, or at least we hope, that that's the outlier. Uh, work is God's gift to men and women, and most people willingly embrace it and engage in it. Some occupations may look more glamorous than others from the outside, but none are without frustration and weariness. Uh, we call those occupational hazards, or more commonly, utter, that's why they call it work. 
But it's nothing more than what the Bible promised in the garden after Adam and Eve uh, fell by the sweat of your brow will you eat bread. Well, we see out of our account in Luke 5 examples of, of both a typical kind of occupation, fishing, that requires toil and promises both torn nets and food to eat, along with a parallel occupation that promises perpetual success because the results are always precisely what our supervisor desires from us. He desires that we go out to catch not just fish, but the men and women he has chosen beforehand to receive his gift of life and an eternal inheritance in his glory. Luke begins the account with a description of Jesus attempting to teach a, a crowd of people along the shoreline of what he describes as the lake of G Gennesaret, but which we know more familiarly, familiarly as the Sea of Galilee. Gennesaret was what the fertile plain uh, south of Capernaum was known as, and Luke accurately called this body of water a lake rather than a sea. Uh, there were other names for this very large body of water, such as Chinnereth or the Sea of Tiberias, but it is actually an inland lake uh, situated about 700 feet in eleva elevation below the Mediterranean Sea. It was an important commercial hub of the whole Galilean region, surrounded by small towns and busy with activity, and Jesus spent much time there. I say Jesus was attempting to teach. That seems to be the picture Luke describes. He has previously set the stage for such a situation in which the crowds that came to him were so large that they pressed in on him. He had become popular in a very short time on account of his unique teaching style. Uh, people were saying that he taught with authority and not like uh, the rabbis but also because of the miraculous powers he had demonstrated. So he had come here, and we discover as the story unfolds, <clears throat> Simon Peter, likely his brother Andrew, and both James and John, the sons of Zebedee, uh, Simon's partners in their commercial fishing business, were also there. They had come to know Jesus uh, and had a certain relationship with him. In a sense, they had become his followers, or at least were leaning that way. Uh, we know that from a lengthy description John gives in his first chapter of his gospel. They had been disciples of John the Baptist, and uh, hearing his testimony about Jesus, they began to follow after Jesus. There came something of a domino effect. At first, Andrew followed him, then his brother, Simon Peter. Afterward, Jesus found Philip, who then uh, went and told Nathaniel about Jesus. Soon there were a number of them from the same general area who in some form or fashion were beginning to fashion themselves as disciples of a kind of Jesus of Nazareth. And as our scene opens, uh, with the crowds, again, I say, pressing around Jesus to the degree he was having difficulty finding a proper place to address the crowds. These fishermen uh, were, were in the same area. Uh, they had been out on the lake all night long fishing and were now performing the tedious task of tending to the nets they had used, washing uh, and mending them in order to hang them out to dry in preparation for the next evening. They had two boats in their business, uh, lying idle now at the water's edge. Simon Peter was the owner of one of the boats. Uh, because of their relationship, Jesus felt free to climb into his boat, and clever preacher that he was, asked Peter to put out a little way from the shore. They could continue their labor, but Jesus saw the opportunity 
uh, to create his own lecture hall by separating himself slightly from the crowd so that he could address them and take advantage of the acoustics uh, created across the lapping waters. He then adopted the typical sitting posture of a Jewish teacher and he began uh, to teach the people. Well, we have a wonderful uh, gospel episode here. Uh, having read it, being familiar with it, uh, we know what will eventually happen. It's often referred to as the miraculous catch, that great quantity of fish miraculously harvested, uh, defying logic and bringing the fishermen to their knees and in fear and awe. But this verse here, uh, verse 3, uh, Jesus sat down and began teaching the people. We must not uh, overlook it. It may appear simply as an activity uh, lurking in the background, but it's integral to the whole scene. And Luke uh, labors throughout his gospel to emphasize it, the primacy of the Word of God. Uh, Jesus had told Simon and the others earlier, this comes from Mark, but he had told them, this is what I came for. And if you look up just a couple of verses there at the end of chapter 4 and verse 43, I was sent for this purpose. That primacy was to be authenticated on this day uh, by a revelation of the power of God even over the fish of the sea but the ministry of the Word of God came first. Jesus was teaching the people from the boat. He knew that his time on earth was uh, short, it was limited, and that there would soon come a time uh, when his physical presence would no longer serve these needy people. Uh, yes, Jesus had compassion on them, and yes, he had the power to heal them and to work miraculously in their lives. But he also knew the frailty of men and women and how fragile even the strongest faith among them could be. So it was important for him to underscore on every occasion available to him that his children are to live by his word and not in the thrall of his miracles. Memory of the miraculous will fade, but the word of the Lord abides forever. Well, how long he taught, we're not told, but we are told in verse 4 that when he had finished speaking to the people and perhaps the crowds dispersed, he turned to Simon and he spoke to him. It seems innocent enough, at least to me, put out into the deep water, Simon, let down your Nets for a catch seems innocent to me because I'm a very poor fisherman. I have a secret sin, instant gratification. If a fish wants to be caught by me, he better strike quick or I'm done with him. But Simon Peter and his companions were not poor fishermen. They were professionals and I hope it doesn't sound in any way sacrilegious for me to say it, but our Lord Jesus Christ, having taken on a real human nature and become a man, was not a professional fisherman. He had get, grown up a carpenter by trade. Now, Peter had not yet obtained to a full knowledge of who he was, but he knew he was no ordinary man, and so plainly, as the text reads, he resisted the impulse a professional fisherman might have had to promptly reject unwanted fishing advice from a non-fisherman and instead gingerly responded in verse 5, Master, uh, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let down the nets. And that he called Jesus master indicated the respect he already had for him. It was not that common Greek address, Lord, that is often translated in a similar way, but a, a word that indicates authority nonetheless. Peter acknowledged a kind of sorted subordination to this man. 
But I think Peter wished that he knew more about fishing than he, he did. For if he had known, he would have known that fishing was better on the lake during the night, and that fishing in the deep water of the lake during the middle of the day was almost certainly a fool's errand. Besides, this kind of fishing was not rod and reel uh, casting, but back-breaking uh, work involving large, heavy nets uh, made even heavier when soaked with water. They would lay the nat nets out upon the wa water in a, in a semicircle and, and then draw them back into the boat hand over hand to retrieve uh, the catch and, and then move about and repeat it throughout the night. And this previous night had been fruitless. That happens. Gee, the fish were biting yesterday. We were really hauling them in yesterday. Peter's complaint is true to life. Uh, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. Nothing. He was pulled in two directions. The path he wished to take was to politely thank his master for his advice, but explain why it made no sense, but that Peter was prepared to act on Jesus' suggestion reveals a reluctance on his part to ignore any word coming from his mouth. And so, despite their weariness and, and, and their skepticism, they obeyed his word. I will do as you say, Simon replied. What that reads literally is, upon your word, we will let down the nets again. That's the obedience uh, the Lord asks of you and me today. When his word comes to us, it may seem burdensome, even daunting. And we try to ignore it, but it persists in our consciences and, and it won't go away. And when we finally uh, reflect upon it, we realize we don't want to do Jesus' word. It's not something we wished to do. Perhaps you have something right now that you are feeling, perhaps the Lord wants me to do this, but you don't want to do it. That's happened to me multiple times. You don't want to do it. But obedience brings reward. And that's a lesson Simon and his companions now learn. They obeyed. Uh, they rowed the boat back out into the deep water and let down their nets for a catch. And Luke uh, reports in uh, verse 6, when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets uh, began to break. Uh, and so instinctively, they began to uh, signal to their partners in the other boat for them to row over and help them. Well, they must have been close by, uh, no doubt, curious to observe this futile exercise and what would happen, but when they either saw or heard this signal from Peter, they quickly rode over to assist, and together the, the four of them uh, host, hoisted the nets full of fish onto the two boats. But it was too much. There were too many fish, and the boats began to sink by the weight of them into the water. It was, I say this literally, it was an incredible catch of fish. It was not to be believed. This kind of thing did not happen. It was incredible. Not to be believed. Jesus had shown for Peter and his companions he had chosen to lift the veil of his deity and put it on display. How else could it be explained? It won't do to suggest, as the hardened materialist must, that this was an example simply of dumb luck. Uh, the logic of the Gospels and their portrayal of Jesus will not allow for that. You read the Gospels, Jesus is the God-man. Uh, were he only a man, then that solution would have to do, but that is to ignore his deity, this union of both a divine nature and a human nature in one person. And that may challenge our 
uh, limited, finite minds, and it has for centuries, but it's the only explanation. In his divine nature, Jesus was omniscient. He knew the number of the stars in the sky. He knew the number of the hairs on one's head, and therefore he could have easily, at his father's command, identified the location of a huge school of fish. In the same way, he would later uh, tell Peter which fish to find the coin in its mouth. But I think it was more than that, because he was too Almighty God, the sovereign of the universe, who had created all things and in whom all things hold together. He was able to even direct the fish at his silent command to gather in the place of his choosing. And there the fish were hauled in by these dumbfounded fishermen. And that's the clear explanation of what ensued after that. Simon Peter and the others also immediately recognized that they were in the presence of the divine. As Peter felt the full impact of what had just happened, Luke tells us he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Here is moral clarity. Here is intellectual and psychological clarity. Previously, Simon Peter knew the man, Jesus of Nazareth, was like no other man. He had gotten uh, Peter's and the other's attention, but now he had revealed himself directly in the sphere of Peter's field of expertise. He had met him in his wheelhouse, so to speak. Peter knew fishing, and he knew there was no rational explanation for what he had witnessed. This was something only God could do, and now he was in God's presence, and he could not stand. Like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, who was granted this vision of the Lord God sitting on his throne and the seraphim uh, above him, calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is filled with his glory. And Isaiah could only be well. Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Like the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation chapter 1, turning to see uh, the voice uh, speaking to him in a vision, and seeing one like a son of man, his eyes like flaming fire, his feet like burnished bronze, his face like the sun shining in its strength. And when John saw him, he fell at his feet like a dead man. So here, Peter instinctively cried out, Get away from me. Get away from me. It was the spontaneous cry of defense in the presence of Jesus, now with his deity unveiled. All of Peter's pitiable sinfulness was also unveiled. I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. There would be, there could be no respectful master here. He knew he was addressing the great I am, Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, and he melted before him in horror. We often speak in our Christian circles, our theological circles even, of the fear of God. We try to define what it means and and usually we rightly uh, describe it as the kind of reverential awe that fittingly describes how we feel when we understand in our minds and hearts the majesty and holiness of God. It's the fear of God, this reverential awe. But Peter here had experienced far more than mere understanding. 
He was in God's presence. And he instantly and intuitively felt the filth and, and degradation of his own sinfulness and knew like he'd never known before God's holy wrath against his sin. And Jesus' presence now, he trembled at his own guilt and shame. And feeling his own unworthiness, he asked Jesus to please go away. It's a rare thing for a person to come to a place like this. It's rare for the believer to come to a place like this. For This is a place of great discomfort. And we rarely order our lives in ways that would re impress upon us such a disquieting self-reflection. This is what Anselm of Canterbury was striving to communicate in his seminal work, Cur Deus Homo. Why did God become man? His conversation partner in the book, it's a back and forth. Some of you have read it. Uh, he, one would say something, the other one would respond. But this partner uh, could not come to grips with, with this idea. He could not come to grips with the idea that Christ's death on the cross was the reason for his incarnation. The reason he left his throne and came and was born of a virgin and took on human flesh and lived as the perfect God-man and went about doing good and was obedient to the Father uh, to the end, all the way to the cross. The reason for that uh, was, the reason for him coming was to do that very thing. And Anselm could only remind him of the sinfulness of those that Jesus came to save. He said, you have not yet considered the greatness of your sin. At this moment, Simon Peter felt the full weight of his sin, and he fell down prone at Jesus' feet. If Jesus had seen the fish at the bottom of the sea, he could also see to the bottom of Peter's heart. And now Peter saw it too, and that's why the Lord immediately comforted him. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Jesus knew he had to first calm him in order to, for him to comprehend what Jesus was going to say next. Uh, this would be a new juncture in Peter's and the others' lives. From now on is what Jesus says in verse 10. From now on, henceforth, you'll be catching men. It was more than a prophecy. It was an implicit command a turning point had been reached. Uh, Peter and his companions were to embark on a, a new occupation. Uh, previously, they'd been catching fish. Uh, that would prove now to be emblematic of their new venture because now they would be catching human beings. As the King James Version put it in Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In his commentary, uh, Leon Morris, should say in his excellent commentary, Leon Morris draws attention to a, a hidden meaning within this verb, catching, catching, catching men, catching men and women. Uh, it's actually a combination of two Greek roots, uh, the first meaning alive, and the second meaning to catch. And so, it, ha it, it, it has the sense, something of catching men for life, catching them for life. Previously, uh, they had caught fish, and this may sound cruel, but they'd been catching fish to kill them. Uh, it was for food, after all. But now, in their new occupation, they would be catching lost sinners in order to bring them to life. This, after all, was why Jesus had come uh, to catch all those the Father had given to him and to bring them to life. It was why he had been sent by the Father in the first place. Uh, later, it's in chapter 18, he, he finds Zacchaeus, remember? He's found Zacchaeus, uh, and he's brought him to life. Uh, and he said there, today salvation has come to this house for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
He came to give life. Of course, he would do that at great cost to himself, obeying his Father's will for him to the point of bearing his penalty for sin on the cross at Calvary. Uh, this was to be the price to him for bringing those dead in sin to life in him, making this entire scene a beautiful picture of God's glorious love for his people, for his chosen, for his elect to be expressed and extended and embodied in his followers for years to come. Catching men for life. What, what an occupation. What do you do for a living? I catch men and women for life. It's a wonderful description of the ministry of the gospel to think and I want you to, to think that all of us here today who have received that gift of life, we are the bountiful harvest of the Holy Spirit working through what probably seemed at the time feeble efforts by others to be fishers of men, praying with you at bedtime, someone giving you a Bible, taking you to church, inviting you to a Bible study, bearing testimony to you of the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. That was to be the mission going forward for these four men. Jesus had been teaching uh, from one of their boats. They were nearby, uh, wearily mending their nets after having been up all night perhaps not even listening. That happens in church sometimes. <laughs> perhaps not even listening to the man. They'd heard him. But he had come to seek four of them and to bring them into a more lucrative line of work that would become their permanent, though difficult, passion for the rest of their lives. Before... They had been following Jesus from a distance. Now they would become fully his disciples. And they would witness many more miraculous catches. So they brought their boats uh, to land. And Luke concludes the account with the four fishermen's response to Jesus. They left everything and followed him. They left everything and followed him. One might say, weren't they following him already? Uh, both Luke and the other gospel writers portray Peter and several of the others following Jesus around, listening to his teaching, uh, marveling at uh, the wonders he performed. He had beckoned them. You read the other gospels. He had beckoned them and they had followed him. But here, uh, they were determining to be his disciples in the fullest sense. Uh, this was a complete faith, a complete trust, a complete commitment. They were now disciples of Jesus Christ. They had just participated in the greatest catch of their uh, lives. Uh, their, their ship had come in, we might say. This was a career deal for them. And they were leaving it behind, leaving it all behind. Later, in chapter 14 of Luke, uh, we find Jesus attracting these enormous crowds. They were following him, uh, but they were deluded. You've read it, you know. They only wanted what he could give them. And so the Lord challenged them. He said, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then a few verses later, he's, he told them, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Still later, in chapter 18, in his interview with the rich young ruler, he had, had identified that young man's fatal deficit of faith, and he told him, one thing you lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. You know that story, too, so you know he couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Luke records that he became very sad for he was extremely rich. He didn't believe that treasure in heaven 
could be better than treasure on earth. That interview shocked even the Lord's disciples because they believed that wealth on earth was a sign of God's blessing upon people. If you're wealthy, God must have blessed you and been pleased with you. But Jesus explained, there's no one, no one who has left everything behind like you did. He's talking to these disciples. There's no one who has left everything behind for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come, eternal life. Someone has said, we don't really start living until we find something worth dying for. Jesus is a, a savior worth following. He is a savior worth dying for. And here are these four fishermen uh, operating this business. It was a going concern. And they dropped their nets and followed Jesus. They didn't return to them. Their decision was a radical step of faith. There are many uh, diverse occupations in our world. I always marvel at the multitude of ways there are to make a living. And when they tell us, we often shake our heads and wonder. I met someone once whose family seemed prosperous and was told later that, well, their business was distributing the sesame seeds that hamburger bun manufacturers use on their, on their buns. Well, of course. I mean, how else do those sesame seeds get there? There are many diverse occupations. But each one of us who are disciples of Jesus is to devote his or her life to catching men and women alive. It is the radical commission of the Lord, and we never retire from it. That's what Simon and the others did. I, I doubt there were many of their family or friends who supported their decision. Uh, no doubt uh, some told them, you're making a huge mistake. Think about your future. Uh, you have security here, you're throwing it all away. But they had seen in Jesus something more, uh, more even than security and respectability. And so they obeyed radically. We see that sometimes in people. William Kelly was someone like that. William Kelly. Kelly was an outstanding student of the Bible whose scholarship and Christian work were used greatly by God to give him an exceptionally effective ministry in Great Britain at the end of the 19th century. His linguistic abilities and general brilliance earlier in his life, though, had caught the attention of the faculty at Trinity College in Dublin. And they furiously recruited Kelly for the college, urging him to take up work there and so distinguish himself. When Kelly showed a complete lack of enthusiasm for their suggestion, they were taken aback. After all, it was a great privilege to be asked to serve on the faculty of, of Trinity. And one of the professors finally asked him in, in exasperation, but Mr. Kelly, aren't you interested in making a name for yourself in the world? And Kelly responded, in which world, gentlemen? He had determined that their offer of privilege and fame could not compare with the even greater offer he had accepted and that even then was occupying his time. Jesus Christ had made him a catcher of men. He had stolen his soul, captured his affections, and redefined for him what was of true value in this world. He served a living Savior who was worth following and worth even the scorn of the world. The four disciples took the same path. Jesus had shown them their sin and their need for a savior and they dropped all uh, to follow the only true savior. Well, don't be alarmed. <laughs> Very few of us, I suspect, have truly dropped all uh, to follow Jesus. We're the losers for it. Uh, but very few of us have. We still cling to vestiges of the old baubles and pleasures that used to occupy our time. There's room for growth for, for all of us in our love for the Lord and in our, our service for Him. 
Uh, Jesus spoke of treasures often, you, you know. That was how he viewed the stakes in our discipleship. Uh, the earthly treasures we fear losing and that we continue to cling to are ephemeral. Uh, he reminds us that they rust or they're spoiled by the hidden moths of our world or they're stolen from us by evil men. But store up your treasures in heaven, the Lord commanded. Those will last forever. For they are the living and doing we do out of love for him and he will shower us with blessings when we obey him. But if you're here this morning, perhaps, and you feel the weight of your sin and have not yet come to know this Savior, uh, Jesus' call extends to you also. Follow Him. Follow Him. Confess your sins to Him. Trust in Him to save you from your sins and receive the free gift of forgiveness of your sins and the promise of an eternal inheritance with Him and membership in the body of Christ. Could it be that Jesus Christ is calling you to life today? So begin your journey of discipleship, uh, uniting your voice with ours and others as we sing in our hearts, Jesus, Lord of life and peace, to thee we lift our voice. Teach us at thy holiness to tremble and rejoice. Holy, holy, holy Lord, we love your holy name. Let's pray. That is our confession, uh, Lord God, because of the work of grace that you have accomplished in our lives, those of us who belong to you. We love your holy name. Uh, we're thankful that you have uh, dealt with our sin. Uh, you haven't ignored it. Uh, you haven't changed yourself in order to accommodate us. Uh, no, uh, you dealt with it. You sent your own son at great sacrifice. He gave himself on the cross and he bore the penalty for our sins upon himself, the perfect lamb of God. We praise you for him. Bless us now, Lord, uh, we pray as we remember him in the Lord's Supper that it be pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. We have a hymn, and it's number 40. Please stand, number 40 in the hymns of, songs of praise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.